Hello everyone and welcome to a review of Sunrise Lane, a brand new game from Reiner Knizia and Horrible Guild, who did provide me the game for the review. Let's touch on how roughly the game is played and then I'll give you my thoughts and feelings on it. Starting with the youngest player and then going clockwise around the table, you'll do one of two options on a turn. You'll either build houses and or parks, or you'll draw cards. The thing you're really going to want to do is that building houses and parks because that's going to be getting you points. So at the start of the game you must start from around, up, down, left, right, the central space in the middle of the board. From then on you can either on a future turn start again from around there or any built structure, be that a house of anyone's colour or a park. By committing to putting houses down, you're able to put down as many on that colour as you have cards. So, let's say you have three red cards and it's a red space with two dots on it. The dots, well that's going to be for scoring, but it's a red space, so you play the three red cards, putting three of your houses on top of each other on that space. The points are then worth the three cards times the number of dots on the space, which we said was two, for a total of three times two, six points. Now, some of these spaces go up to five uh, dots of different colours, maybe five blues. So even a one blue card, a level one house on that, would be worth five points. Now, once you've built a house, you can't build on top of it later, be it yours or someone else's. However, if you have built houses that round, you can then carry on, but it has to sort of snake in an up, down, left, right fashion from the house you've just built. So, say I've done those three reds and I still had a yellow card in my hand. Well, there's a yellow space next to the reds that I've just built, so I can play that and put a one-story building on that, again scoring some points based on the number of cards I've played multiplied by the number of dots on its space. At any time on your turn of building houses, you can choose to discard a card of any colour to place a park down, be it continuing your sort of snaking houses that you're putting down or before you start putting houses down and then you must go from next to the park. It can basically block any space regardless of the colour of card you've played and this space you're putting it onto. Effectively, you're discarding it and the park is then becoming a wild. The park doesn't get you any points, but it might allow you to skip over something you don't have. So let's say I've played two green cards to put two green houses down, and I've scored those, and then the next one is red. I don't have any reds, but maybe I discard a pink colour card to put a park down, and then I can use my final yellow card to place on a four pip yellow. Well, it might be worth it because that's four points. Regardless of what you do and how many houses you do build on this, well, you're going to draw one card at the end of your turn. If you don't do the build houses action, you will draw two cards. So regardless of which one you do, you'll at least get one card at the end of your turn, but by doing the draw cards, you'll gain two instead of just one. And that can be very useful for trying to maybe get a hand, because your hand limit is five, of maybe four or five reds or blues or whatever to plop down, hopefully on a space with loads of dots, getting loads of points. The game goes round and round the table like this with people either playing or drawing cards and that's going to go until one player has two or fewer houses. You finish the round up until whoever took the first place so everyone has the same number of turns and then it's final scoring. There's two zones that are blue and they score individually and then there's two red zones which again score individually. The blue ones will score for whoever has the tallest building. So let's say one player, they have a five storey building in the blue area and no one else has one, maybe someone else has a four or whatever. The, the person with the tallest building, you will get ten points, the next person down will get six and then the next person down will get one. And you'll do that scoring for both blue zones separately, and then you'll go on to the two red zones. And it's whoever's got the most houses. It doesn't care about height, they still count as a one building, even if it's five so stories tall. How many buildings you've got in the red area, and again, they're scored separately. Then finally, across the board, everyone's going to count up basically the longest sort of continuous group of their own coloured houses and whoever's got the most again gets 10 points then 6 
then one point. You combine the points that were earned during the game with the bonus points at the end of the game and then you see who has the most points and they win. If there's a tie, whoever has the most cards left in their hand splits that tie, otherwise the victory is shared. So let's start off with the production quality. It's pretty cool the way that the houses do stack on top of each other, it's super simple, although you do sometimes have to make sure you're stacking them perfectly in terms of if you try and do them with the faces siding a different way, they can sort of topple over a little bit. But normally, and the fact that you're only ever going up to a five height stack, means that those houses stack very nicely and create quite a cool looking board. I do slightly wish that the dots on the boards were maybe just a little bit bigger and with some of the colours choices, just if you're not in the perfect light, it's best sometimes to double check when you're playing cards. The cards, the sort of colours in the deck, they're definitely different enough, but some of the small dots of maybe the pink and red in a bad lighting, you might be able to confuse them. There's a really good rhythm to Sunrise Lane in terms of a lot of the time you're going to be trying to build up a hand, but you're always on the lookout for an opportunity. Oh, I've got these cards in my hand. Mm, I kind of need someone just to take that one sort of space there. They'll get a few points from it, but it will open up the opportunity with the cards in my hand to put down a few different houses and get to that big sort of five dotted space and after your first game you really realize how good those spaces can be you can score easily 20 points off of one of those spaces whereas other times maybe you've played your full five cards and have not even broken double digits so it's sort of the more you play, the more slightly cutthroat the game becomes, certainly at lower player counts. So you've got that rhythm where you sort of you're building up your hand, maybe taking that draw card action because it's worth it. Or maybe, oh, I've got a one blue and there's a good ish blue space. I'll just take that before anyone else can claim it. I still get a card at the end of my turn, but Sometimes you take that draw card action and you slowly build up. Oh, I've got a lot of blues. Okay, I'm going to slowly try and maybe work my way across the board or wait for someone else to get near it. And then I'll plop down a park and then here, four blue cards on a hopefully good scoring blue. And then you're down to like no cards and you've got a, or oh, you'll draw one at the end of your turn and then you slowly work back up. And there's some interesting times where it's like, hmm, no one else has got many cards. Maybe now is a good time for me to draw as well because no one's going to be claiming a spot. Or maybe this is the time just to play a couple of cards and get a few points sort of scored while no one else is able to do too much sort of from a big hand of cards. So I do like those sort of ebbs and flows of the gameplay of, I have this big turn, I play a load of cards, then I need a, t a little bit of time to work back up and to gain a, a hand of cards again. But it's still choices, even when you have very few cards of, that seems like a space that I don't want an opponent to get. So I'll play even one card to effectively block it or take it. And those parks can be used like that to block one. Oh, there's a four red spot opened up right next to the building I've just put down. I don't have any reds left. Hmm. Maybe someone else does. Maybe it's not worth me risking it. So I'll just play a random card that I had in my hand to put that park down and block that spot. And you can also use that to be like, right, if I've built a load of stuff in this area and parked a load as well, you can do one park per turn, but over multiple turns, you can maybe put many parks down. Or well, maybe I'm securing the fact that I've already got a load in this red area. And that's the bonus for the red area, have the most there. So if I'm putting parks down, it's limiting the opportunity for others to sort of ninja in and get a load of buildings built here. So some really sort of cool choices and that nice ebb and flow of the gameplay. The end game scoring is a really nice touch and it's something the game does need. If it was just throughout the game, well, you can very easily see throughout the game, oh, they're pulling ahead. But are they pulling ahead at the expense of some of those end game scorings? 
which you can still see throughout the game who's doing well at. Oh, you've got a, a four built up in that area, in that blue area, and it's the tallest. Or well, maybe I could still go for a five. Fives are quite hard to get down because you need five of the right colour, but they're not impossible. Maybe even just getting a four in that area alongside someone else's four might be worth it for that end game scoring. And there's many different ways that you can try and get some good scoring at the end, and I like those options. I would, however, have liked, there's a tile that reminds you of what those are. I'd loved it if you flipped it over and they were just slightly different scoring. So maybe in this game, you really want to build those tall buildings or you really want a connected one, a uh, load of connected houses because that scores more in this game. It feels like a slightly missed opportunity to just have sort of, this is how it normally scores, but then throw in this one tile or flip this tile over that's already included and the scoring is just slightly different. It could have just meant that the games felt a bit different with players maybe going more for taller buildings than ever before or even just swapping over. Right, this time it's the, uh, the sort of areas on the left half of the board or the right half of the board rather than being the reds and the blues. They could very easily have made it the red, green, yellow and blue zones or even the north, south, east, west zones. And you could then have gone right in this game, it's the diagonals that score like this or um, the top half of the board scores like this. It feels like that's maybe a missed opportunity for just some variation. So each game feels a little different, but I think they've gone for the simplicity of you can teach this game super quick and you just go the blue zones in both of them. You want the tallest in the red zones. You want the most. And I think they've gone for that because it's super simple, very easy to teach to people, but it does mean that there isn't that variation of those final end game scorings from one game to the next. Despite those slight negatives, I've had a lot of fun with Sunrise Lane. As I sort of alluded to, it's very quick and easy to teach. What you're doing on a turn is either building houses with the cards in your hand or you're probably grabbing a couple of cards from the top of the deck to try and get a set of say three yellows so you can plop them down next time for some good points. It does get a bit more cutthroat a, as you play multiple games because you realise how good some of those spots on the board are but also as you reduce the player count because you're actively being able to stop your one opponent rather than, well, there's four of us round the table and we're kind of splatting here, there and everywhere. And different people are going to like it at the different player counts because you can block each other very, well, not very easily, but you can certainly try to block each other a bit versus the sort of everyone's blocking each other and there's a bit slight more chaos to where people are building and more players. But I've really enjoyed it. I like the flows of the gameplay that you get those big turns where you plop down like your whole five card hand and then you need to work back up. And then sometimes you haven't got that full hand size of five, but you still get a good turn by just playing two cards on the right spot and gaining a load of points for it. A lot of points are earned throughout the game, so you do feel like you're getting little hits of, yes, I've done something along the way and you've got some cool bonuses at the end to aim for as well. So yeah, I've really enjoyed it, can definitely recommend it, and I'm looking forward to getting it to the table more sort of moving forward. But that is Sunrise Lane from Reiner Kinizia and Horrible Guild. If you've played the game, uh, let me know what you thought of it in the comments section below. And until next time, have a sunrise great day.